Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. Hi, I'm Claire Davison. I'm an engagement officer in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I will serve as your moderator today. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for Book Club. Today, we will discuss The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, selected by Department of English Leaders and Faculty. So a big thank you uh, to our panelists, Elizabeth Hewitt, an associate professor in the Department of English, and Susan Williams, professor and chair of the Department of English, for sharing their expertise with us today. Susan and Elizabeth will get us started with some opening remarks about the Scarlet Letter, and then we will open up the conversation to your questions and comments. So Susan, take it away. Thank you so much, Clara, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. I've been looking forward to this all semester, actually, and we're at the end of the semester here on campus and where I'm coming from you today. And uh, it is a true delight to know that there are people interested in talking about The Scarlet Letter, which has become one of my very favorite books. And I'm hoping to try to convince you of why uh, it should be that. Uh, I do wanna say a word about this whole event because this is the last in our series. Um, this was started last uh, spring during the beginning of the pandemic as a way to have engagement for all of us who are looking for reading and was based on a survey of books that we might talk about for, of our alumni from the English department who were asked to think about top 10 books. And uh, this, we started this last spring. This is going to wrap it up for this year. Um, and I do wanna thank my colleague, Robin Warhol, who's the chair of English who started this in the spring uh, because it's been a great experience for us all. It's interesting to me that when those top 10 lists came out, uh, the Scarlet Letter was not on the list. And it was on my list personally, but it wasn't on the list that came from the alumni. And uh, I have been thinking all year that I would like to talk about why I think it still should be on the top 10 list. And again, I welcome all of you here. Um, as it's turned out, we're also having this not only at the end of the semester, but also a couple of days after Mother's Day. And when we were talking about this, uh, Beth and I were talking about the book and getting ready for today, we, we were sort of saying, well, it's the perfect uh, Mother's Day book. And we were kind of joking, but the more I thought about it, I think it really is the perfect Mother's Day book. And I wanna just mention that uh, because I think it's one way to get into thinking about uh, the entire story of the Scarlet Letter. Um, First of all, why is, it a, why is it a perfect Mother's Day book? Because it's about a mother at the end of the day, Hester Prynne um, and her baby Pearl. And uh, it has, that has been a character that many people have known over the years. Um, I myself first read the story of Hester Prynne in high school, um, in an all girls high school in Atlanta, Georgia, where I went to high school, where uh, I don't remember focusing much on motherhood. I do remember focusing a lot on Puritanism and the theocracy that comes from that and the religious side. Uh, but nonetheless, I remember thinking about Hester as um, a mother with this young child that she was trying to care for, basically kind of while living alone in um, Boston in the 1640s. And then I studied the book in college and in graduate school. And when I got to Ohio State, I started teaching American literature and um, I taught the book quite a bit, I still do, but I especially did when I first started teaching. And one of my students uh, came in one day and she said, I identify with Hester Prince so much because I'm a single mother. And when I come to class, I often wanna bring my child with me because I have to take care of my child as during the day. And I've never read a book that's about single motherhood in that way. And it means so much to me. And that really changed my understanding of kind of how important it is that Hester and Pearl are so linked and that motherhood is so key in this book. The other thing about why it's a good day, a good book for Mother's Day is that this is very much a book that was written to commemorate and honor mothers in Hawthorne's life. Nathaniel Hawthorne, born uh, in the early 19th century, uh, was very close to his mother. His father died when he was quite young. And this book, which was published in 1850, was written just about a year after his mother had died. And prior to her death, she had actually been living with him and his wife, Sophia, um, and their new relatively young daughter, Una. Uh, 
um, all together in Concord, Massachusetts. And he had this household of very strong women, um, one age seven, which is Pearl's age in the middle of the book. Uh, one, uh, his wife, who was an artist and a wonderful mother who he uh, was very close to, and then his own mother. And he thought a lot about motherhood uh, in that writing. And that's another way in which I think this is a, a kind of good Mother's Day book because it was influenced greatly by the women in Hawthorne's life. So that's one way I want to enter out into the question. And if you want to talk more about what kind of mother is this, uh, I think that's going to talk more about that. But we might, in the question and answer, get a little more into, into motherhood with that. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say about, in general, why I think this is a, a top 10 book um, and why it's such a classic is that it was meant to be a classic. And by that, I mean it was produced and packaged and advertised in the 1850s by a, um, a, a publisher named James T. Field, Fields, who believed very strongly that for the United States to be a strong democracy in 1850, in, in the mid 19th century, that um, it was important that the American authors who were busy writing, particularly in New England, which is where he was and where Hawthorne was, that it was very important that they produce classics that could stand up against British literature. Um, and so this book has always been meant to be a classic in the sense that Fields, this publisher, knew about Hawthorne, who had been writing a lot of short stories, but not really a novel. And he thought he was an excellent writer. And he more or less commissioned the book by visiting him according to one story coming on a train um, to Concord to visit him from, to visit Hawthorne from Boston and to say, uh, don't you have something that I can put in my publishing of trying to make a great uh, American library of books? Um, and Hawthorne equivocated, they finally came up with a manuscript which turned out to be the Scarlet Letter. And um, I'm gonna just hold this up. We practice whether anybody can see this, but this is a little bit, uh, this is uh, shiny only because it's in, um, plastic. This is one of my prized possessions, and I want to shout out to my own mother, who I think is watching, who helped make this possible in my life. It is a first edition of the um, Scarlet Letter, and it's in very brown, basic, um, it's in very brown, basic uh, leather, and the point of the publishing of this book was that when it was lined up on a shelf, if you had a bunch of these books, they would look like American writers had produced something serious and very much of a classic. Um, and uh, Hawthorne also really wanted the title page. It says the Scarlet Letter in red because of course it's scar Scarlet, but it's very much um, trying to be a very serious looking book um, in the way that it was published. And uh, this, this publisher, James T. Fields, was able to produce a very orchestrated advertising campaign, one of the first major advertising campaigns for a book in American history um, in the 1850s, where he started saying in newspapers about six months before this book was produced and published uh, that an American classic was essentially on its way. Um, so he did a lot to promote Hawthorne as a great American writer and as a classic. And the book has never been out of print. Um, those of you who were on the, at the Moby Dick discussion a couple months ago um, will remember that my colleague, our colleague Elizabeth Rinker, really pointed out the fact that Moby Dick wasn't particularly well known in its own century, in the 19th century, and was really resuscitated in the early 20th century. And um, the fact that this book was never out of print, I think, is because it was so well uh, promoted throughout its uh, history, including in the 19th century, and people really did read it. Um, uh, and it also had an introduction that caused a little bit of a controversy, which didn't hurt. We can talk more about that later if you're interested. It's called the Custom House, and it was an introduction that was a tell-all about a job Hawthorne had had and been fired from, so there was that too. Uh, but it was meant to be a classic, and I think that that is another piece of thinking about it that as a piece of cultural history, it's important that it was promoted as an American classic and we can talk more about the content of that. Um, I'm also very proud in terms of Ohio State that um, Ohio State English department specifically in the 1960s through the 1990s 
uh, produced the, the complete scholarly edition of all of Hawthorne's works um, through a very orchestrated editorial office that uh, many generations of, of American scholars at Ohio State worked on. And I actually have the Scarlet Letter in a different office, but these are very also very serious looking books. This is a different one of Hawthorne, The House with Seven Gables. It, it looks even bigger than the one that I showed you to begin with because it has a lot of notes about the details of the manuscript. Uh, but that also, in terms of Ohio State and why I think this book is important, I'm very proud of the fact that this department over time has shaped Hawthorne's, our understanding of Hawthorne by producing this scholarly edition. So I want to think about motherhood. We can think about why it's a classic. You can ask about the introduction if you want to. Um, and then I just want to offer one more thing to get us teed up, and that is uh, a, a kind of another aspect of its classic status to me, and that is that every time I've ever read it, which is quite a few times now, I always feel like it has something to say about our current moment, whatever that is. Um, and one definition of, of a classic, of course, is something that, that stands the test of time. But another one I think that's related is that it's something that continually can be adapted and made legible in a new way, depending on the context in which you're reading it. Um, and I just wanted to say briefly, and we can talk more about this if you're interested, uh, that I have been uh, fascinated in the past year by a lot of things, but one of them is how I have been seeing Hawthorne appear in the media um, and the Scarlet Letter in particular. Um, and I've been seeing it because I have been seeing the phrase, the Scarlet Letter a lot, applied to the shame of COVID. Um, and specifically the idea that if you were infected um, early on in the pandemic, it made you feel like uh, you were wearing a scarlet letter. I've seen a lot of that in places like the New York Times in quotations. I've seen it in lots of media. Um, and I wanna just pause here for a second and say, if you were to read something that says, um, COVID is like a scarlet letter, not saying Hawthorne's the Scarlet Letter, just saying a Scarlet Letter. Um, I just would love to know what you're thinking, and you can throw this into the Q and A, I think, um, and just put down what 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 a Scarlet Letter mean to you in that context. Um, what does it mean to say a uh, infection is like having a Scarlet Letter on your chest or having something like that? So I'm just going to pause for a second and let you think about that. All right, Bonnie says something shameful. Mm. And Elizabeth says guilt, stupidity. Those are great. And you can continue thinking about this as we do it. I just want to, you know, uh, say that I think it is a movable um, image in many ways. And that's a whole other topic. The Scarlet Letter morphs within the book to mean many things. It's a Scarlet A, of course. And I did bring one more prop today, which is a mask that was advertised on Etsy as a Scarlet Letter mask. So here is the Scarlet A that you could wear um, to really say that you had a Scarlet Letter. Um, within the book, a Scarlet Letter goes from meaning A for adultery, which is what's kind of happened. But that word is interestingly nowhere ever in the book all sort of outside the book, but it can mean a lot of other things too, and we can talk about that. Um, but what I wanted to just end with for now is to say, it seems to me in the past year that in public media and in quotations from um, restaurant owners or from public health officials, that the, the image of the scarlet letter has, has basically, yes, come up to mean shame or stigma um, maybe guilt also, I think we can talk about if there's a difference between those two, but shame and um, the idea that that the illness can be shameful because somehow um, you have gotten something that makes you an outlier, uh, that you're kind of quarantined or you're away and the shame of COVID. Um, and it is very interesting that it's been used to talk about the shame of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. It's been used if you have high infection rates and you're in a university, for example, on a platform to say it's like having a scarlet letter on your school. Um, and so I think that the whole question of shame uh, 
and guilt, I think both of those are really key words, are one of the things that I'm currently reading the most with the most interest and is another example of how you can see different things in this book at different times, which I think makes it a great book. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Susan. Um, Susan and I are really excited to talk about, about, about this novel and I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to actually kind of return to a lot of the topics that um, that Susan described, and, and including mothers, um, uh, why it's a classic. I even found a little prop that I'm going to I'm going to show as well, um, and the larger issue of shame. But what I wanted to start talking about was actually kind of a meditation on on why it wasn't on the list. Um, Susan and I actually were, we, when we talked about actually wanting to do a Hawthorne novel, we talked about whether or not it was somehow um, uh, shameful to, to, <laughs> to, to cheat and to put Scarlet Letter on the, on the list, even though people hadn't, hadn't um, identified it. Um, and it got me to thinking the fact that I think more than almost any, more than any novel that I regularly teach or talk about, The Scarlet Letter really provokes incredibly hostile and negative reactions among students. The, the students recoil when, they, when, when I mention the novel. Um, and they always tell me about how they had to read it in high school and how much they hated it when they read it in high school. And I always think, I always get kind of sad, um, but I also think in some sense it's fair um, that the their lack of investment in a tale about 17th century um, uh, marital infidelity and also um, guilt and dour Calvinism isn't that surprising. Um, it, might, it might be more surprising if they were, if they were really invested in that particular story. Um, and that leads me to ask and has always left me led me to ask the question why do American high schools so frequently require it why do they so often assign it in their literature classrooms and who thought that that was a good idea um, and, and in some sense Susan has actually begun to answer that question um, because as she suggested it really was one of the first novels that was understood to be an American classic um, and in fact, actually, that it, it, it's an issue that really plagues um, people like Susan and I, who are teachers of American literature, and especially 19th century American literature, since so many of our important novels, um, I think here about both um, The Scarlet, or I think about The Scarlet Letter, I think about Moby Dick, I think about The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, all of these novels are given to readers um, too young. <laughs> they're, they're assigned to high school students before, it, before they really um, can read them in, in, a, in, a, in a useful way. Um, and it's actually interesting because um, uh, D.H. Lawrence, the famous uh, British writer, actually diagnosed this problem um, in, as early as 1920. And he said, um, quoting Lawrence here, he says, we like to think of the old fashioned American classics as children's books. And uh, notably, Lawrence actually specifically identifies the Scarlet Letter. And he tells his readers, he says, we need to look past, I'm quoting Lawrence here, because I love this phrase, the goody goody, lovey dovey, blue darling, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And listen and hear the quote, diabolical undertone of the Scarlet Letter. Um, and it's just such a, it's, uh, um, those of you who've read D.H. Lawrence know, it's, it's just kind of a great, uh, his, his understanding of the ways in which the American literature has been misrepresented as juvenilia is really, is really interesting and useful. It's also, I think, significant that Lawrence is actually repeating um, uh, uh, Herman Melville, who actually 70 years earlier, um, not talking about The Scarlet Letter, but talking about Hawthorne's um, earlier short fiction, also chided um, Hawthorne's readers. He describes them as being mere skimmers of pages. Um, and, and because they're only skimming Hawthorne's pages, they misunderstand him, Hawthorne writes, I mean, excuse me, Melville writes, and think that he's quote unquote pleasant and quote unquote harmless. Um, and Melville goes on to say they, they fail to recognize the terror, and that's the word he uses, um, that Hawthorne unearths as he uses his fiction to probe human behavior. 
Um, and I really, for me, this is this is really right. I've always felt that Melville is an incredibly acute um, reader of uh, of Hawthorne because he recognizes this 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 terror that lies in all of Hawthorne's fiction. Um, but despite this good counsel on the part of Lawrence and Melville. Um, high school curricula can, has persisted in assigning the novel to 16 year olds. Um, I, I, I mentioned that in part because I think one of the reasons that I'm lucky enough to like the novel, um, uh, and I've, I've always liked it so much, is because I had a fairly derelict literary education. <laughs> um, and it means that I actually, unlike Susan, I didn't read it in high school. I didn't even read it in um, college. I didn't read The Scarlet Letter actually until I took my first American literature class in, in graduate school when I was about 25 years old or such. Um, I probably still wasn't quite old enough to really get the terror um, at the heart of the novel, but I was sufficiently senior that I could recognize some of the diabolical undertones. And as I mentioned to Susan when we were talking um, this weekend about the novel, the thing I, I remember most about that first reading of of the Scarlet Letter is the encounter that happens between in the forest between Hester and Dimsdale and Pearl. Um, those of you who who remember the novel, I, I'm, this, it's not an unusual scene. It's a kind of it's a climactic one in the novel. Um, and I, you know, I'm I, I had I didn't have a great American education or American education in American literature, but I certainly knew well enough to know that the forest was a dangerous place, but also it was a place where people could become more free. So when the when the trio of them go into the forest, um, I was uh, um, I I was thrilled to the bone. Um, in fact, I even now countless times, you know, I can't I don't know how many times I've read this novel. Even now, when I read the scene, I'm still thrilled to the bone when Hawthorne lets Hester um, passionately um, propose that she and Dimsdale escape the tyranny of Calvinist Massachusetts. I had certainly read enough novels to know that women who have sex out of marriage don't have happy endings. Um, um, but because Hester had been had been so um, depicted with such vibrancy and such passion by Hawthorne, and because Hawthorne had actually explicitly writes that the Scarlet Letter had given Hester, um, and here again, I'm quoting him, a passport into regions where other women dared not tread. I imagined that maybe um, uh, her freedom would offer, you know, that freedom was a possibility for Hester. Um, uh, after all, Hester explicit uh, Hester Hawthorne explicitly compares Hester uh, to the antinomian Anne Hutchinson, um, and we might talk about that a little bit too. I I often teach 17th century literature, and I'm always interested in thinking about um, Hawthorne's interest in Anne Hutchinson. Um, and he writes that about Hester, the world's law was no law for Hester's mind. So he really describes her as this radical, and as a young feminist. I thought that maybe Hawthorne was actually um, was going to showcase for me how it was that a prohibition, a scarlet letter, could actually be transformed into liberation or emancipation. Um, and I, I also, <laughs> I will also confess um, that I probably um, then and now was eager for a lovey-dovey. Um, <laughs> rom-com <laughs> in which in which Hester and Dimsdale and Pearl would live happily ever after. Um, I had certainly read enough novels to know how unlikely it was that The Scarlet Letter was going to turn into Jane Eyre, but I, I, I still had hope. Um, <laughs> um, and I want to say like the diabolical quality of Hawthorne is not is not that he dashed my hopes. I was I knew that I wasn't going to get my happy ending. Um, there was going to be no reader. I married him, uh, <laughs> but I. It, so it's not that he dashed the hopes; it's how he crushed them. And that's I just want to talk about that scene because I still I still really find it haunting. So those of you who remember the novel or or have read it more recently, 
know that Hester, when she's in the forest, she unfastens her scarlet letter and she casts it on the forest floor. And then she calls for her daughter, Pearl, to come over to be with her and Dimsdale. She wants, she wants um, Pearl to know her father. That's, a, that's the sort of the scene. But um, when Pearl approaches Hester um, and she sees her mom and her mom is not wearing the, the, um, the A, Pearl refuses to come over. She's like, she, she absolutely refuses. And Hawthorne writes about the scene is, um, uh, assuming a singular air of authority, Pearl stretched out her hand and with a small forefinger extended, she pointed evidently towards her mother's breast. So I always, I have this picture in my mind of, of Pearl um, kind of pointing at her at her mother. And it's only after Pearl goes over and retrieves the letter um, and actually refastens it to her dress that Pearl recognizes her mother. Um, that she, she won't come over to her until that. And then she comes over and she kisses the she kisses the A on her on her on her uh, bosom. And I always find this scene really extraordinary because it means that it, it, Hawthorne makes the child, this little girl, seven-year-old little girl, who he also describes as being the scarlet letter endowed with life, the most powerful instrument of the law. Um, little Pearl is described throughout the novel as being like nature, nature's playmate, um, an infant dryad, wild, defiant, impish, but she ends up exerting a much more um, powerful punitive authority, um, mo more formidable even than the Calvinist Church of, of Boston. Um, and this continues. So a couple chapters later, when Dimsdale is about to give the election day speech, Pearl is Pearl and, and Hester in the, um, the marketplace. And Pearl asks. Um, is, it wants to know if that's the same man that was in the forest. And Hester, um, Hester tells her to hush. And she says, we must not always talk in the marketplace of what happens in the forest. Um, but the thing is that <laughs> Pearl has already proved that the distinction between the marketplace and the forest is an illusory one. They're, they're really, the, the power of the law happens whether or not we're in the wilderness or whether or not we're in, in the market. Um, um, and, and Hawthorne emphasizes, I think, the same point. I feel like it's a strong argument in the entire novel um, when Pearl, our, our elf child, um, our, our infant dryad, ends up being the beneficiary of the enormous inheritance by um, or from Roger Chillingsworth. Um, and as, as Hawthorne writes, she becomes the richest heiress of her day in the new world. And then she, of course, returns to the old world where it seems that she becomes a member of the British aristocracy since she sends her mother back letters um, with armorial seals on them. So we kind of, you know, she's, she becomes landed effectively. And I was thinking about this in relationship to motherhood, um, largely because Susan and I really were struck by how much the novel is, meditates on this issue because I feel like Hawthorne's historical romance um, is not just telling the story of a human mother and child, which it certainly is, but also very much thinking about political mothers and their children, and, and especially Great Britain and her infant colony. Um, as Hawthorne writes, America was conceived as a quote, utopia of human virtue and happiness. Um, but the story he outlines for us, I think, is that the new world is inevitably going to follow the path of the, of the old. Um, and that's why when we first open the novel in the new world, we see things that are very familiar from the old. We open, if, if you recall the, first, the chapters, we open at the prison door, and then our second chapter is, takes place, the second chapter is called the marketplace, and it takes place, of course, on the pillory within the marketplace. Um, and so the, the history that Hawthorne sketches for his readers is one where, um, and this is why I find it such a haunting, haunting novel, is that we can entertain the possibility of freedom. That's the kind of seductive possibility that we get in the forest, but it's only ever a fantasy. Um, and Hawthorne's political history of the United States is, is the same story. It's about a commonwealth that's born from dissent and revolution, the possibility of freedom, 
um, just as Pearl is born from the adulterous relationship between Hester and Dimsdale. But ultimately, the United States, like Pearl, is going to repudiate both dissent and revolution. Um, and, and which, which led me to, as I was kind of like thinking about this, I thought, well, maybe that's the reason why people, young people, feel so disenchanted by the novel. Um, no one who's 16 <laughs> wants to have the idea of freedom thwarted. <laughs> um, so, you know, which only brings me back to wanting it to not be read in high school classrooms and wait until people are a little bit older. Um, but I just wanted to end by, by saying um, one of the things that I find so remarkable about The Scarlet Letter, why I think um, it, it is so durable, as, as Susan has described, the, we, the reason why it always feels as if it's contemporary, that it kind of speaks to our concerns, um, is, that, um, is that it tells so many stories. Um, it's when Susan and I were talking, she, uh, she, she used a phrase that I really liked, which is, um, it's a device of multiple choice. Um, and I think that that's really, that, that's really right. Like we can say, okay, ha Hester is clearly disciplined and shamed and singled out, as a lot of you noted, by the scarlet letter that, that lies on her chest. Um, but it's also the case that the, the beautifully stitched A comes to mean a lot more than adultery. Um, it means, you know, A stands for, even in the context of the novel, we could say that A stands for Abel, it stands for angel, it stands for anarchy, it stands for antinomianist, it stands for allegory. Um, and it's that amplitude of interpretive possibilities, which is why I find the novel always so thrilling to read over and over again, um, and why it's not a children's book, I might, I might, <laughs> might add. And I just, I, whenever I teach Hawthorne, I'm just going to conclude with this image, because whenever I teach Hawthorne, um, uh, I always turn to a particular simile to try to convey to the students what this device of multiple choice looks like. Um, and so I, basically what I tell them is, we kind of were led to believe um, um, or kind of tricked into thinking that Hawthorne's fiction is like a Rubik's cube. Um, it's a very anachronistic simile that I've constructed for my students, um, which is to say, we think it's this kind of childish puzzle for which there's only one solution, right? You just get it in the right order and then the colors line up. But for me, like the, the, the marvel, the, the wizardry of, of Hawthorne's writing is that he actually, he doesn't give us a Rubik's cube, he gives us a kaleidoscope, right? Um, and so the point isn't at all to line up the colors, it's rather to catch the refractions. <laughs> um, and the fact that, you know, that Susan can so rightly say, oh my goodness, the, like even in 2021 to talk about a pandemic, people turn to Hawthorne gives us a sense of that kind of refractory power. Um, so, um, um, and then my, my finally, I just was going to, just to evidence how much Hawthorne really did become a classic author remarkably quickly, and especially a novelist, I have um, my, I really love historical games, and so I have the game of authors, and this one is from 1880. Um, and one of the, there aren't very Ameri many American authors in it, but, he, but here's my Hawthorne card. Um, and, the, and the three novels that Hawthorne has is The Scarlet Letter, The Marble Fawn, which we don't read that much anymore. And then, and Susan, you'll find this really interesting, Dr. Grimshaw's Secret. Um, I think because it had just been posthumously published by Julie Warren. I think that that's the reason. But anyway, so now I'm just excited to talk with you all about the novel that I like so much. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Susan, for those, those wonderful introductions. Um, we had a, a few more responses come in to, to the question about what the Scarlet Letter means to folks in the audience. Um, so Karen mentioned a singling out for having brought shame or illness upon oneself. Uh, Nancy said something that isolates someone, um, Karen, or Sarah said a target, Maggie said something that sets you apart and isolates you. Um, so maybe our first question uh, from Sue, why does Hawthorne call the Scarlet Letter a romance? I think it all goes back to the notion of uh, the, trying to invent the idea of something that will become an American classic and that you can define as 
um, being a particular kind of American writing and art, which uh, Hawthorne was pretty invested in. Uh, and there are sort of two main ways to think about that. First of all, the term romance, uh, we might think of it as rom-com, the kind of book that Beth didn't get when she read it the first time, a romance that involves love and um, has a happy ending, et cetera, uh, as in Shakespeare. But there's also the idea of uh, sort of heroic romance and chivalric romance that comes up in the medieval times. And in both cases, the, the important thing is that romance was a important sort of high art term, even in 1850, from British literature. Um, and Hawthorne was very influenced by medieval and Renaissance writers. He named his daughter, I mentioned it quickly, Una, U-N-A, after a character in Spencer's Fairy Queen. Uh, and so he was very interested in romance and being in kind of a tradition of British literature and saying that American writers could do that. However, at the same time, he wanted to reinvent the idea of what American romance would be. Um, and he developed a pretty sophisticated definition, which shows up in a variety of places in his writing um, about the fact that to him, a romance was different from a novel because it was combining realistic detail and everyday concerns, which we might say is associated with the novel, with that kind of multiple choice going back, you know, to, with the idea of something that was a bit fantastic or a bit, um, to use the kaleidoscope image, refractory that would make you think you were a little bit outside of something that was totally realistic and was in kind of another world. And what Hawthorne really thought was significant for himself, but also some of his friends and, and other writers was to try to get that balance between detail and character that you would want to follow and something that would refract in exactly the, you know, the way that Beth was talking about um, that would let you think at a higher level about allegory or about uh, symbolic value, et cetera. And um, in the Scarlet Letter, uh, not in the actual text of the Scarlet Letter, the story, but in the preface, the custom house, which I alluded to, he gives a very famous definition of what um, he means by romance, and it also is an is a scene or an image, um, and it's a beautiful one. It's of a room in the moonlight, um, and he talks at great length for like two paragraphs and says, um, if you've ever gone essentially into a room in the middle of the night where there's just moon, um, the domestic scenery that you would normally see um, has all been changed to look um, very much like the imaginary kind of fantastic. And it's that idea of the way a child's shoe or the doll, he talks about all these things, um, can become strange and remote, even as they're familiar. So he's trying to get a kind of middle ground between the detailed and, and the kind of um, fantastic. And that, that idea of moonlight, he, comes, he talks about it a lot. There's actually some moonlight in the Scarlet Letter, but it's, it's largely, I think, related to trying to do something a little bit different um, and the multiple choice and trying to be a classic. Um, all of that is, is exactly right. The only, uh, only thing I was going to add to it, just because I also was looking at a comment, um, I, I think it's actually the same person who wrote it, um, uh, Susan, um, not you, Susan, but <laughs> um, is that I always think um, I mean, as, as Susan just described, the, the romance for Hawthorne is a way, is a, is, he wants to distinguish it from what he describes as the novel. Those are the kind of, the, the, that's the distinction that he makes. And he clearly sees, I think, the romance as requiring more artistry. Um, than the novel. Um, it's, it's, it's what, it, it, you know, not because it's so fantastic, but because it requires something to make it more fantastic. Um, all, all, the, in, all the novels that Hawthorne writes have these extended meditations in their prefaces about what a, the romance writer needs to do. Um, and I have always thought that the description that Susan just um, uh, summarized from the Custom House essay where he's describing what exactly the romance writer does. It always reminds me of the description of um, what Hester does with the letter, 
so that in certain sense we can say, well, the you know the the, the prohibition of the um, of Boston was you need to wear this A, this you know this letter on your chest, and Hester, and we could understand that as a novel, right? And Hester's like, okay, I have to wear this thing, and it means this thing. But what she does with with that um, is that she transforms it into something else, right? That because she's an artist. Um, because she's so exquisite, not as a writer, but as a as a as a sewer and an embroidery, or um, she can in fact actually, I mean, in some sense, literally change the meaning of 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 the the a. I mean, I think we, I think many of us can really feel, and that's what the, the, um, Susan said. It it um, uh, again, not Susan in the comments. Um, it says Hester made the a so pretty and decorative it becomes an icon for her craft and promotes her business as a needle worker. And that's absolutely right. But a part of me has always thought that Hawthorne kind of identifies Hester as being a romancer, right? Somebody who can take the mundane and then actually turn it into something exquisite um, and beautiful. Um, and so that's how I always think about the romance as well. Thank you. Uh, so we have a comment here from Bonnie. I was given a copy of the Scarlet Letter as an appreciation gift when I was a graduate student at Ohio State in 1969. I'll have to reread it. Thank you. And a question from Karen about the Custom House introductory chapter. The narrator does identify himself as the representative of his ancestors. What things is Hawthorne up to, or what is Hawthorne up to in this introduction? So that part about kind of finding, I think you're alluding to finding the family history, kind of drawing on the manuscript. And um, th there really are two pieces of that introduction. Um, and just very briefly, the first piece is him talking about something called the Custom House, which is in, which is a, a governmental building that he worked in, um, in Salem. Uh, Massachusetts, and uh, you can go visit it. It's right on the water. And his job, which he got through a political appointment uh, through a college friend, who was Franklin Pierce, and kind of moving on, um, then uh, he uh, spent a lot of time just stamping goods that came in. And it was a very bureaucratic job. It was everything that being a romancer is not, because it was very much business writing and kind of, you know, all of that, but it paid the bills for all those women I described at the beginning, and he felt very much that he needed to work there, and because there was a change in um, the president's office, and you know, it, he got fired, essentially, from his job because the different, the Whigs came in in 1848, and he got uh, fired out of his job, and he was very bitter about it, so the first half of that entire essay is him saying, I never really liked that job that much. It was a bunch of people who were really not doing their job very well. And I'm not bitter at all, but of course he was very bitter. And then at the end of it, he says, well, my consolation prize for having kind of left this bureaucratic job, which, uh, which I officially don't like anymore, uh, is that I found a uh, manuscript in the attic of the custom house that, uh, that I want to tell you about, and that becomes the Scarlet Letter. And um, we scholars think that at that point, he, be, he calls himself the surveyor and he's finding, the, or he's kind of thinking about finding this manuscript. But at that point, it's basically a persona. It's not really Hawthorne himself at that point. He did not find an actual manuscript up in the attic. Um, he made up this scene to say that he was writing about a history that already existed, which is another issue with writing an American kind of classic is the notion of how to deal with history. And Beth can say a lot about 17th century history, but there was a notion that there wasn't a lot of history to draw on. There of course was, that it wasn't all a literary history yet. So he's looking at a manuscript and he has this amazing scene where he imagines going up in the attic of the custom house, he being the, the narrative persona in this essay, who's Hawthorne, but really, kind of a made up version of Hawthorne um, to find this, this manuscript. And of course, what falls out first is a sort of moth eaten A, which is supposed to be the real thing. And then a long kind of manuscript um, rolled up, it's all yellow. And he says, I uh, read that and I decided that um, I would sort of basically adapt it. So he makes himself not original, but I would add 
that, you know, I would be true to the idea that, that I would add kind of my own details. And that gave him this authorization to write the romance, essentially, because he's saying, I have this detailed source that I can write about, but now I can kind of add my, um, to use the analogy Beth just said, my embroidery. <laughs> I agree with you, Beth, that uh, Hester's a romancer. And so what he's doing in the custom house is giving himself the authority to write the story about a 17th century woman based on a manuscript of, uh, you know, that, that, that is finally, in fact, based on some history he really read, but it's, there wasn't exactly this manuscript, but he did, Hawthorne did study a lot of um, Puritan history in the, as it was written in the 19th century, and it mentioned um, Anne Hutchinson, who Beth talked about, but it also mentioned a lot of men and women who were punished for various trespasses in the society by having to wear a letter. So if you were drunk, you might have to wear a D for drunk, or if you were um, blasphemous, you might have to wear a B for blasphemy. There was no specific scarlet letter, um, but he wrote about that, but he had done that history. And so he's giving this idea that there's a manuscript and that gives him the authority to kind of go do his own thing with the story. Um, and it also sets him up as an historian of the Puritan period, um, but with his own special twist. And he, in fact, there is no scarlet letter uh, as a punishment prior to Hawthorne writing about it. He kind of used some, uh, some history that he could build on, but he first used the idea of a scarlet letter in a story in 1838 called Endicott and the Red Cross, and it wasn't really a character, it was a side, it was a side description of a woman standing in a Puritan town with an A. And then he wrote a notebook entry that said, hmm, I might want to do something more with that. And then in 1850, he did. So in a nutshell, what he's doing there is giving himself the authority to write the Scarlet Letter. Yeah, I, I think that I, I was thinking as you were talking, Susan, that um, I, I that I'd always feel like one of the things he's doing is he's positioning himself in terms of two other uh, kind of somewhat well one very famous and one somewhat famous American um, writers um, so he's following in the footsteps of Washington Irving who likewise uses that same kind of gambit which is oh I have this object and then I'm going to take this object and I'm going to use that as an archive from which I'm going to make invent my romance so you give it a kind of historical um, authenticity um, and Irving does it all the time it, it, those of you who've read Irving know that a lot of Irving's quote unquote histories are in fact actually romances. Um, and the other person I'm thinking about, and I think it's probably, you know, I'd never really thought about this before, but I have a feeling that that um, Hawthorne is in, in, in talking about the romance, he's probably also thinking about Charles Brockton Brown's, the distinction that Brown makes, which isn't between a novel and a romance, but between history and romance. Mm -hmm. And Brown basically says, there's really no, he's very sophisticated. He's like, there's really not much difference between a history and a romance because a romancer is gonna tell us what happened in the past. It's just that a romancer has a little bit more license to invent things. Like for example, that there was a thing called the Scarlet Letter as opposed to just kind of you know more general um, uh, um, condemnations. And I, I, so I feel like I, my sense is that Hawthorne is really thinking about those two earlier historians slash romancers as he kind of comes up with the conceit of the Scarlet Letter. Um, and, I, I, you know, I also think that, uh, you know, Hawthorne was deeply interested in the 17th century and kind of early American history. Um, and I think I, I always have felt that that's partially for two reasons. One is that in this period of time, everyone was really interested in it. Um, it was it was the period in which a lot of the 17th century write, writers and the kind of, you know, quote unquote, like, you know, I was going to say founding fathers, but pre-founding fathers, people like Winthrop and Bradford, all of their writing was actually getting put into, into print. And we were kind of constructing this story that um, that Puritan New England was the genesis of, um, of, of the, the United States. But, you know, that, that isn't happening in the 17th century. That doesn't really happen until the 19th century. And I think Hawthorne is thinking about that reconstruction of the 17th century past. Um, but I think he's also really, I mean, 
he's very critical of Boston. I mean, you know, reading reading the Scarlet Letter, where you get the sense in which he really, really doesn't like the the community. Um, he feels he feels their cruelty. He feels their um, the, the ways in which they constrict lives. And I think part of that is just thinking about Hawthorne's own history, and you see this in other novels as well, is that he himself is connected back to that 17th century Calvinist path, um, and especially a, a, a Calvinist that were, um, you know, doing things like, uh, um, you know, killing adulterers, and as he says, Quakers, and other religious dissidents, um, and witches, and I, I, you get a sense in which kind of Hawthorne is working through his own, what we might describe as like historical guilt um, in, in kind of meditating on um, their treatment of Hester, um, just simply because we know um, that his own, and I'm trying to get the ancestry right, is, it, is his great, great, great grandfather um, was one of the, um, uh, the judges that presided in the kind of infamous witchcraft trials of the, of the 1690s. And I've always thought that Hawthorne is doing a little bit of a mea culpa <laughs> um, to a certain extent in, in uh, Scarlet Letter. We have a question here from Paul. Chillingsworth becomes increasingly diabolical as the book progresses. The bequest of his wealth to Pearl seems odd. Is it redemptive in some way or is it a way of continuing to exercise some kind of power over Hester? Uh -huh. uh, thank you for bringing up Chillingsworth. He's always such an interesting uh, uh, character to talk about and yes, becomes very diabolical. Um, my quick answer to that is that um, in the period this is set, not when it was written, but set in the 1640s, um, uh, it what would have been Chillingworth's uh, responsibility to actually um, sort of father Pearl, even though he was not the biological father, because of the laws of coverture, which was the sort of marriage idea that the that the husband protected the wife, and that um, even if a child was born out of wedlock. Uh, he sort of had authority over um, Pearl. And he spends the book, of course, not in any way wanting to, to take that role on. And in fact, he says early on in the jail when Hester goes and talks to him and we realize that they know each other and kind of get a little bit of their backstory. Um, he says, basically, I would be, why would I want to take on my responsibility when it would bring me shame. It's, you know, that's that notion that he's kind of like, I don't want to exercise my duty in this because I have been shamed. And then he becomes very obsessed. So my quick answer is that it was his legal responsibility to do that. And once the secret is kind of out and he know, you know, everything's kind of resolving, the fact that he can make her this inherit, you know, kind of he he does have wealth. That's what's led him to come from England and Holland then to Massachusetts. Um, is kind of rectifying legally and, and going and making Pearl, uh, you, you know, has, uh, Beth said she was, she stands for the law and she does, but once she kind of grows up, she gets a little bit out of that stance and becomes more kind of a, I don't want to say conventional, but at least an aristocratic kind of heroine. And I think it's because the legal side kind of ends up getting right-sized at the end. So Susan, you don't you don't read it as morally redemptive at all. He basically just follows the letter of the law in in providing the inheritance for her. I think there's some moral redemption too, you know. Uh, but do you? What do you think about that? Yeah. Such a he's such a compelling character because I mean, as as um, as Paul said, like he's he's really becomes monstrous at the end of the novel. But when he starts off, he doesn't really strike me that way. So I was kind of thinking, oh, well, maybe it's a kind of, it's an early example of like a redemption arc, right? Like, wow, he's, he's, he's done really kind of a monstrous thing in essentially torturing Dimsdale for seven years. Um, and yet there is a certain kind of moral redemption. But I actually think your reading is I mean, I think I'm wrong. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. I think, I mean, of course, multiple choice, right? We can be right. really wrong. Um, but I think that uh, the other torturous thing, by the way, I think is the fact that he makes Hester keep the secret for so long. I mean, that's just, there's also the secrecy of sort of saying to somebody, you must not acknowledge me 
because it will be humiliating. I mean, imagine trying to, you know, that the father, your husband, ex-husband or husband is there and you're having to keep the secret and she's so strict about that until the forest scene that you talked about. Um, but I, yeah, I do read it kind of probably mostly legally. I do think that Chillingworth in the beginning, I agree, um, has to me some, uh, I have some empathy for him or sympathy for him because he's, um, he's looking for love. It's kind of an arranged marriage, but he's, he, he quite, I think, wanted, he, he was a scholar. He was disabled. He's kind of older and he um, had this sort of sad heart's habitation that was empty, he says, and he wanted to find love. And then, you know, he comes to Boston and finds that, uh, and he, he got, by the way, he had on the way to Boston, he somehow got into um, a Native American community where he was hostage for a while and had to come out of that. So all this stuff, but I, I still basically read it legally. Yeah. Yeah. I was, when I, I know that, um, the book club did, um, middle March earlier in the semester. And I always, <clears throat> because of that early marriage, I always think about him in terms of Casabon, right. You know, sure. and I find Casabon, you know, an infinitely more loathsome character. It's, <laughs> maybe this says more about me than, <laughs> <laughs> than Chile Hingsworth, but I find him more upsetting. Um, but then, of course, you know, then then Chillingsworth just does, does become a monster. So it's I, I, it's he's a really interesting character. <laughs> I apologize we weren't able to make it to all the questions. Um, but Susan and Elizabeth, do you have any parting thoughts about why uh, the Scarlet Letter endures? Uh, for me, I'm going to go back to the phrase that Beth did say we talked about, which is that device of multiple choice, which is actually attributable to a scholar at Harvard in the 1940s, F.O. Matheson, who was one of the first scholars of Hawthorne. Um, I, I think that uh, if we're interested, which I think we are right now, and I think we have been for much of our history in the idea that you can, you can hold two ideas in your head at once that are some, somewhat contradictory. That is that Chillingworth could be a monster and also in some ways redemptive. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's an arc, it's almost like simultaneously you could be both. Um, uh, I think that because of that and, and just unpacking that in all of its dimensions um, about whether Hester's a feminist or not a feminist, et cetera, I think that there's, there's ways to come at the book that make it perpetually adaptable and amenable to um, thinking in fresh ways in any given historical moment. Yeah. I agree. Uh, a is for um, ambiguity, right? <laughs> um, but but for maybe part of the reason he he um, uh, you know I'm think I'm just I'm just paraphrasing Melville here, but maybe part of the reason that he um, uh, is sustained is because he allows for that. But at the same time, also as you know, as Melville says, seems like he offers us really can potentially be seen to offer us really easy parables. Um, and so he therefore appeals to a range of different uh, different readers. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. A big uh, virtual round of applause for Susan and Elizabeth for, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. This was wonderful. Um, so thank you all. Stay safe. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Um, and we'll see you soon.